Hey there! Welcome to the special lesson of After School. I am Jasper from the Fungi Academy and today we will be learning about the wondrous world of intelligence. So let's dive into it. So what is intelligence? We as creatures with brains like to think that all intelligence derives from the brain. To be honest, our brains are pretty good and we have reasons to be proud of them. I am after all expressing myself on a device and in a language ultimately created by our brains. Go brains, yeah. Unfortunately, our brains have a big issue. They limit ourselves from recognizing any other kind of intelligence. Telling someone small brained will always be an insult. Here are some examples of organisms that are undeniably smart, yet do not have a brain. The moon jellyfish can age backwards, form hordes of clones and regenerate lost body parts all without a brain. Slime molds can survive as single cellular organisms, yet like to hang out together. A very special slime mold known as Fisarium polycephalum can solve mazes, mimic and improve the layout of man-made transportation networks and choose the healthiest food from a diverse menu. And all this without a brain or central nervous system. So how do all these things happen? I don't know, I am just a simple creature with a brain. You don't even have to look around yourself, look within. More and more research is showing that our state of mind and our mood is actually partially controlled by the microorganisms in our gut. It's called the gut-brain axis. Down in the gut, bacteria make over 90% of our neurotransmitter serotonin, which regulates our emotions. Wait, so you are telling me that my almighty brain is under the influence of tiny single cellular organisms? Who orchestrates all of this? I don't know, I'm just a simple creature with a brain. Fungi, to me, are the best showcase of the unexplainable intelligence you find on this planet. You find them everywhere. All organisms depend on their actions. Even individual species can take up several independent roles in an ecosystem. Some fungi start a symbiotic relationship with a plant. That plant can become ill and might become a danger to the whole ecosystem. And suddenly, this symbiotic fungus starts acting more like a parasite. It kills the plant and eventually acts more like a sephirophyte breaking down the complex chemicals that have formed the plant's body into accessible nutrients for the next generation. There is some convincing evidence that all life on Earth derives from fungi. The first multicellular organism in the fossil record is a mycelium network. We know that fungi are capable of transforming solid rock into soil. We have yet to encounter a species of plant in the wild that doesn't form a symbiotic relationship with fungi. This is why I see fungi as the conductor of the orchestra of life. Like when trees evolved around 350 million years ago. The white rot now recycling all the carbon that wood holds in its lignin was not yet present. The trees would just get stacked on top of each other, keeping all the carbon they absorbed into the ground. This potentially led to a massive increase in oxygen levels. A high oxygen concentration in the atmosphere, over 30% compared to 21% a day, allowed insects to grow to massive size. During these times you had dragonflies the size of crows flying around. All because fungi were not yet able to break down the lignin that wood is composed of. As the conductor of the orchestra of life, fungi must be incredibly intelligent even without brains. A species of cordyceps, Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, are some of my favorite examples of the intelligence of fungi. Somehow, this fungus germinates in the body of, let's say, an ant, and instead of colonizing the whole body of the victim, it apparently grows towards its central nervous system and somehow taps into it. Not only does it know where to find the central nervous system and how to tap into it, it also knows how to control the physical moving body of an organism not even closely resembling their own. It controls the ant to walk to a high place above the colony, makes it hold as tight as possible to a branch or leaf before it fully colonizes the ant. Eventually, when the whole body of the ant is consumed by the mycelium, it grows its fruit, spreading its spores over the colony below. 
that an organism without a brain or central nervous system like we understand in animals can do this? Just blows my brain. An organism with a bottom top intelligence, we perceive to have a top bottom intelligence, our minds tend to think it's the singular decision making entity within our body. Meaning many independent cells making collective decisions. There are many examples that show that fungi are not only essential and abundance, but also conscious. Take the mushroom, the fruiting body of a group of fungi, a collective building effort from the mycelium built to spread spores and new genes around the world. It lives for a short time and tends to be consumed by the inhabitants of its environment. Look at the famous Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric. Not really pleasant to eat for us humans without proper preparation, but reindeer seem to have no issue consuming this mushroom. Or take the infamous death cap mushroom, Amanita phalladius, the patently used to poison political figures like Roman Emperor Claudius or Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI. Half a cap of this mushroom can kill a grown man, yet tiny slugs can eat several mushrooms without being their last meal. Okay, enough about the dangerous mushrooms. Let's talk about the mushrooms that we can consume and are good for us. Why would fungi like chaga, turkey tail, reishi, and I can keep going for a while, use up their vital energy to create compounds in its temporal fruiting body that have anti-carcinogenic effects in mammals? Is it struggling with cancer themselves? This seems very unlikely to me. Or lion's mane. This mushroom creates a compound that helps us regrow neurons. Why would it do this? And of course the biggest mystery. Why do so many species of mushroom create compounds like psilocybin or psilocin? What is their evolutionary benefit of doing this? You could argue it works in a, as an effective defense mechanism, but is poisoning not a way more effective way not to be eaten by some other organism? You can say it's a random mutation that just happened to stick around, yet you can find mushrooms that contain these compounds everywhere in the world, everywhere where humans decided to live. I believe that mushrooms do not create these compounds by accident, that all mycelium is at least somewhat sentient of its actions. Sentient of the biochemical compounds it creates, sentient of what organisms live around them and how they can support struggling organisms with a potential or control organisms that will be a threat to the balance of the ecosystem. I see psilocybe mushrooms as a species with the interest of expanding our consciousness and tapping more into the collective intelligence that is shared with all of Gaia. Working with mycelium is a whole catalog of great life lessons. Cultivating them and seeing them deal with issues like contamination never gets old. Just like humans in an ancient battle, the mycelium focuses on surrounding and isolating its competition. Sometimes it's strong enough to completely take over the competition. We as humans have a deep connection with the biochemical warfare of fungi. Certain yeast produce ethanol to ward off bacterial competition. The same ethanol that we enjoy in wine or beer or any other alcoholic drink. Trust me, we are just scraping the surface here. There's so much more to discover about we as a species do know and so much more to discover what we do not know as a species. Do you think your brain can handle the limitless intelligence of nature? Thank you so much for tuning into this special lesson of After School. If you want to dive deeper into the world of sacred mycology with us, check the link in the description and use promo code AFTERSCHOOL for a 15% discount on any of our sacred mycology courses. Hope to see you in class and much love.